Welcome back to another episode of Cartography and Catastrophe. Today, we're going to do something a lot more exciting and explore the final frontier of space. Our tool for today is a video game called Outer Wilds. You can check this out on the Xbox app or through Steam on your computer or through your Xbox console. Finally, I wanted to mention that anything can happen today. I'll try to demo some interesting concepts, but along the way we might run into some problems. So strap in and enjoy the flight. Alright, well I hope you're ready for a fun adventure today. And as we head up to the spaceship, I thought I'd explain how I even came up with this idea for the video. Recently, I was re-recording my Great Year video, and in the process, it really started to occur to me that there's a lot going on in outer space that could end life down here on Earth. Whether that's the sun turning into a red giant, or a nearby star going nova, or a big comet impact directly to the planet, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And therefore, if humans or any other life on Earth want to survive, we need to start thinking of ways to get life off the planet and to another habitable world. And that's gonna be kind of the theme for today's video. So hopefully you're all ready to go. We're gonna strap into our seat right here and let's do it. Now that we've made it into space, let's get into some more details about what I was talking about earlier. If life wants to get out of the solar system, we need to develop some sort of arc that will carry life to a new destination. If we're going to be traveling to a new solar system, that's going to take a very long time. Hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. So we'd have to factor that into our thinking. And also, we can't just go super fast and get there. We have to slow down. That way we don't crash right into our new planet. As I was thinking about this, one thing that made sense to me is that if we could somehow construct an arc within the Earth's hill sphere, then it would stay in orbit. The hill sphere is an area around any object in space where, in this case, see the moon right here? If that is within the hill sphere of the planet here, then it won't get pulled off into another planet's orbit or towards the sun or anything like that. But if it gets too far away from the planet, then it can kind of just drift off into space. Right now we're being affected by the gravity of this planet, so we've got to watch out for that. And because this is just kind of a free form video, we have an interesting thing going on right here, a passing comet. This is something that's been very important throughout the catastrophe and cartography series is the chance that comets have impacted our planet in the past, causing widespread devastation. Based on our current understanding, these comets have a lot of volatile elements and gases and things that are currently frozen. But as they get closer to the sun, they heat up and they sublimate, and that creates the tail that we could see here. And one thing that might happen is that our Earth could pass through the tail of these comets and ultimately those gases could fall down to our planet. If the right conditions are met, then these gases could potentially spark massive wildfires across a large area. And this might have actually happened back multiple times during the 1800s, which would explain the odd Chicago fire, the Peshtigo fire, and quite a few others. I'd highly recommend you check out some of Randall Carlson's videos on this subject. He goes through and reads the survivors' accounts from these fires, and they're pretty horrifying. I think we might actually be able to pull this off. I was doing another playthrough trying to record this gameplay and I actually crashed right into the comet and died. So I'll try not to do that this time around. Alright, I seem to have lost the comet. 
So this would give us a good opportunity to check out the little solar system map right here. And this is a great way to study the motion of the planets and any other objects in space. Pretty much all of the planets in our solar system have a fairly circular orbit around the sun, but the comets tend to have very elongated elliptical orbits, which reminds me of an interesting word, apocalypse. If you break that up, it's actually epoch ellipse. And again, I'll have another Randall video that explains that further because there's some pretty intriguing coincidences with that. Getting back on track though, as these comets enter our inner solar system, they leave behind a lot of dust and gas and debris. Our planet could potentially intersect with the orbit of the comet, and that could cause some problems down here on Earth, whether that's the gas in our atmosphere, or a large coating of dust, or again, the actual rocky debris left behind. And this is just one comet, right? Which could cause a lot of devastation for any planet. Imagine if you have thousands or millions of comets all flying through the solar system along with asteroids and everything else. Space can be very dangerous. And this ties right in with our central concept today. Sooner or later, the planet will get hit by a comet or another asteroid. And if life wants to survive, we need to develop some sort of arc in the event that this does happen. I got a little bit distracted there, and in the meantime our spaceship kind of flew out of the solar system. So let's get back in with our main planets here, and continue on with our adventure. We're getting pretty close to our little stand-in for Earth today, so I might as well slow it down. And as we get in close here, I wanted to talk about another interesting phenomenon we have here on Earth, and that is the eclipse. The eclipse happens because, from our point of view, the Sun and the Moon are pretty much the same size. Now, in reality, the Sun is about 400 times larger than the Moon, but it's also about 400 times further away from us than the Moon. And that's just one very intriguing coincidence about our situation here on Earth. The fact that our Sun and the Moon and the Earth are all just at the right location to cause a solar eclipse. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the Moon. Another odd coincidence is that we only ever see the one side of the Moon, because its rotation is almost perfectly in sync with our Earth's. On top of that, the side of the Moon that we see has a ton of really large craters. But if you look to the far side of the moon, it looks so much different. Why is that? NASA has also documented that when an object strikes the moon, the moon seems to ring like a bell for long periods of time. In some cases, over an hour long. In addition, the rocks on the moon and the dust have oddly high amounts of things like titanium, helium-3, chromium, oxygen, and more rare elements. As we exit our spaceship and walk around the moon here, I thought I'd explain just a few more oddities with our own moon. You might have noticed that the moon has a lot of craters, but for some reason, none of them are more than about 3 or 4 miles deep. Which is odd, because there's no atmosphere to slow down these asteroids, so they should be able to punch a lot further into the moon. There's also some very wide craters as well. The reason this is odd is because the density of the moon. It's not very dense, and if it's not very dense and there's no atmosphere, why do these impacts have such a hard time going any further than three or four miles into the crust? With that said, you know, the moon might actually make a great arc. It's got a very low density. It's highly resistant to impacts. It's got plenty of rare materials available on the surface. And we can keep an eye on things down on Earth. If we wanted to go about creating our own arc, though, well, one way to do that would be with the help of the asteroid belt. We could always take a group to the asteroid belt where we can begin construction on the Ark. There should be plenty of materials in all those asteroids to at least construct the outer shell, or on top of that, the outer rocky layer. And we can even look to nature as a blueprint for the design of our Ark. As some of you might know, a honeycomb, which is composed of the hexagon shape over and over again, has probably the best strength to weight ratio of any structure. Therefore, if we made a titanium shell with a lot of hexagons throughout it, that could really increase the protection of the outer shell, but lower the overall weight. After we've constructed the titanium shell, we could even add a layer of dust and rock on top of it. 
with a lot of important materials that can later be used to terraform or repair the new homeworld that we're moving to. We could even use these elements to fuel the future civilization in terms of their energy needs and things like that. Everything I've just laid out should be possible at some point in the future. We just need to have the motivation and the will to do it. And at this point, we really have neither. Then again, we do have plenty of time until the sun goes red giant. The one area that I still have trouble figuring out though, is how the heck are we gonna move this object through space? I really can't think of any scientific way to move such a large arc through space without any serious problems. Although I could start to consider some less than scientific ways to move objects without technology, but I'm not gonna go there today. And I think we're gonna be lucky enough to land on the comet today. I just hope it doesn't smash into us too hard. Yeah, that was tough. Okay. Well, that was a good lesson at least, you know. If you want to start orbiting a nearby object, you have to match the velocity of it. Otherwise, you're just gonna crash right into it. So there's a lot of physics that get involved with this type of thing, and you really got to be careful when you're trying to fly through space. One wrong move and it's the end. That's just another reason why you'd want something that has a very sturdy surface. We're getting really close to the sun right now. I hope we don't melt. Oh gosh. That was way closer than I wanted to be. But that gave me another good idea. What would happen to our sun if a comet, especially a very large one, just slammed right into it? My guess is you'd have some very large solar flares at a bare minimum. And that would send a lot of energy towards our planet Earth, which could cause another catastrophe down there. So not only do we have to worry about the impact of a comet on Earth or some of the debris it leaves behind, we also have to take into account a comet slamming into our sun and then the sun shooting out plasma and all kinds of other things in response. As I was looking at some data on the Voyager satellites, I realized that in order to slingshot them out of our solar system, what they would do is send them right towards the planets where they would pick up speed and then they would keep continuing on their path to the outer solar system. And that might be something we could try with our own arc that we're trying to build. But at the same time, that could cause all sorts of problems if we get stuck in the gravity and crash. In fact, the gravity would probably be so strong it would rip the arc apart completely and that would be the end of our little trip, especially if we're going really fast. So it would probably be best just to stay far away from any object in space as much as we can until we find our next home world. Then we have to maneuver it in the precise orbit around there without getting sucked in that's going to require a big effort as well. It looks like we're getting pulled into the atmosphere of this planet. Hold on. Whoa. Jeez. I'm going to try and get us out of here. Well, that didn't go as planned. I don't like the looks of that though. This could be very bad. I might not want to get any closer. I'm not sure if you can tell, but our sun definitely is not looking as healthy as it was before. And that's a bit worrisome, because if we're developing our arc right now, we need to get out of the solar system before it goes red giant. 
I think we're running out of time. And right now our current understanding is that our sun will turn into a red giant in a few billion years. But that's based off of a lot of observations of other stars. And who knows, maybe something catastrophic could happen to our sun that changes the timing of its phases. Point being, we might want to get started on that arc a lot sooner than later. We need to keep in mind that if we're going to travel to another solar system, that's going to take a lot of time to get there. And we're going to want to be far away from our own star once it starts going to its red giant and ultimately white dwarf phases, because that could complicate things along our trip. It looks like we've got an interesting planetary system coming up here. There seems to be some sort of volcano world shooting out all kinds of stuff at that other planet, and some of them seem to be impacting. The other planet isn't looking too good either. It's got some holes in it, and if we look inside there, that almost looks like a, a black hole or something. I might not want to get too close to that. It'd probably rip our ship apart. This is giving me another idea. You know, as we're building our ark, we need to have a lot of internal systems inside where we're gonna store the future of life, maybe in some sort of cryogenic stasis, that way they're preserved for hundreds of thousands of years. But you would need to have some sort of crew, either human or some created android or something, that can make sure that everything goes according to plan and fix any problems as they come up. That's something else we need to take into account. Almost like some of the newer alien movies, they have the androids there. But if we get in closer here, yeah, that's definitely a black hole and I'm getting pulled right into it, so hold on. Well, surprisingly, we're okay. And if we look behind us, we have a white hole, which is the opposite of a black hole. And I don't know how realistic this is, but it's, I guess it's possible that uh, whatever gets sucked into a black hole gets emitted by a white hole somewhere else. Theoretically, we could use that to warp through space a lot faster, but I don't think I'd want to risk going through a black hole considering it could suck up light. It would just destroy anything you threw at it, most likely. As we start to head back towards the sun, this reminds me of something else I've encountered over the last few years. The star Sirius is currently the brightest star in the night sky, and it's also one of the closest, about 8.6 light years away. If you look back at some of the old cultures, including the Egyptians, they talk about a time when Sirius was red. And we know that in the Sirius system, there's actually two stars, Sirius A and Sirius B. I always get the two mixed up, but one of them is currently a white dwarf. That means it had to go through the red giant phase at some point in the past. So I suppose it's possible that our ancestors did see Sirius going through that transition period. Although one of the arguments against that idea is that it happened like 120 million years ago. And also if it happened recently, there should be some sort of planetary nebula in the system, which we don't see. But still, stranger things have happened and you never know. If Sirius did go through its red giant phase and ultimately turn into a white dwarf, that would have had consequences for life down here on Earth because there might have been a nova, and if that nova hit our solar system and the Oort cloud and the Kuiper disk, it could have destabilized a lot of comets and sent them into our inner solar system. And I think that's one idea I've actually heard about why our planet has been going through these glacial and interglacial cycles for the last 2.6 million years is that a star nearby, maybe Sirius, went through the red giant to the white dwarf phase, and that ultimately destabilized our Oort cloud and sent a bunch of comets into the solar system. As we saw in the solar system map a few minutes ago, the comets tend to have elongated elliptical orbits, and there's gotta be a lot of them, hundreds if not thousands. If these were destabilized from a star going nova in our vicinity, then maybe that helps to explain some of the cyclicity of our glacial ages in the last 2.6 million years. In other words, our Earth routinely goes through the debris fields of those comets, 
and that causes the transition from glacial to interglacial as they impact us. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our journey today. We're just about done. I thought we'd just sit back and enjoy the view here for the last few minutes. <laughs>